Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to I, since perhaps the age of six, five, seven, I don't know, recall being in, in summer Bible school, they called it, uh, uh, which was strange to be in school during the summertime, but I think my mother got to get rid of me for the week. Uh, and I remember specifically sitting in the classroom and hearing about this person who I went home and told my mother's name was Zucchius. So I have always thought whenever I see Zacchaeus come up, I always call him Zucchius in my head because my little child's heart that's still somewhere in there remembers Zucchius and the little craft project that we made of him climbing up the, the sycamore tree. Uh, those things, for some reason, stay in my head. Uh, I like to chalk that up to there's something childlike inside. Not childish, probably more often childish inside of me, but I hope that there's something childlike and pure that remembers that with, uh, with, with grace and with joy. So Zucchaeus, Zacchaeus, this is the first Sunday where we are preparing for Lent. We have, before Lent begins, we have periods of preparation. We call the pre-Lenten Sundays. And Zacchaeus Sunday is the first one. And I knew it was coming, but as I was looking up in the calendar this week, I said, what? <laughs> Hang on. I thought that was a good month and a half away. But today is Zacchaeus Sunday. This is the first sort of toll of the bell. Hey, get ready. Lent's coming. We're, we're, we're approaching Lent, and, and uh, we need to, to pay more attention to what we're doing. Now, it doesn't mean that we have an excuse to not have been paying attention before. We should be uh, very much connected and cleaving to our liturgical cycle, knowing what the readings are, even every day, reading them and letting them fill us with grace and with the Lord's mercy. But if we're not doing that, then, ding, this is the care Sunday. It's time to start paying attention. Lent is approaching that invitation from God for us to anticipate the great feast of fasting and preparing for the great feast, of course, of the Lord's resurrection, which is Pascha. It is coming. And that should fill us with the same joy that the feast fills us with. When we have this knowledge, this anticipation of the fasting period, we should become very excited. Because right around this time, we've come off of a long season of feasting. We're quite accustomed to feasting, both liturgically as well as uh, among our family and friends. We, and we've reached that, that very dreary part of the, of, of, of the year when the... Um, the weather is, is not especially inspiring, it's cold, and there's that yucky film of nasty all over the snow, uh, and, and we're waiting for something. And then we think about, oh gosh, Lent is hard because we have to suffer through physical death privation or, or uh, fasting or what have you. But if we're doing it right, when we hear that first ding, that Zacchaeus Sunday is here, that should fill us with this beautiful anticipation, this great hunger for the gift of that period of fasting and what it brings if entered into properly or even halfway properly. So there you are, get ready, the day of Sunday. Now, <coughs> this little man, this awful little man, Zacchaeus, was despised, and rightfully so. He was wicked, he was a tax collector, and they earned their bread by skimming off the top, giving to Caesar what was due, what was Caesar's, and taking whatever they wanted for themselves. They were betrayers of their people, not just the Hebrew people, everybody had a tax collector among them that was conquered by Caesar. <clears throat> Caesar didn't care. He, put, he established somebody to be the tax collector. Take what you want, but I get mine. And so the tax collectors were often very wealthy because they were dishonest. They cheated people. And there was nothing that the people could do. Whatever the tax collector demanded in taxes more or less had to be paid. There really wasn't a whole lot of way around that. 
and they are wicked and despised, worse than any outsider, worse than any foreigner, because they, you know, Zacchaeus himself was a tax collector. He wasn't the only one, obviously, among the Jews, among the Hebrews, the Israelites. But he was in particular foul and reviled because of the way he treated his own people. He was worse than any foreigner, any, any of the people that had been scattered. He was worse than that. And Jesus is passing through Jericho. And obviously there was some fanfare around it because he wouldn't have known to climb the sycamore tree. And he's quite interested. He was a little bitty man both in stature and in how much he mattered to his people. Both in his physical stature and how much he measured up to worthiness. Standing before God, he was nothing. And he made himself something out of, out of what he gleaned off the top. And he hears Christ approaching. He, he, surely he's surrounded by an entourage. Jericho is a relatively established, decent-sized city. You can imagine there was a little bit of a crowd. And he climbs up this tree because he's probably doing one of these and couldn't see. Ever gone to a concert and somebody's tall, standing in front of you? And, you know, he's doing one of them, jumping up and he climbs the tree to see Jesus. Now, walking through a big city with your entourage, with your posse, lots of crowd around you. Why would Jesus even notice this itty-bitty man up a tree. Jesus is in Jericho on purpose because Jesus knew he was going to encounter Zacchaeus. I almost forgot his name there for a second. He knew he was going to be there because we needed to hear this story. We needed to be participating and present in this moment in Jericho. We are, as the gospel is proclaimed, we are there in Jericho and we are witnessing Zacchaeus climbing this tree, that terrible man, that awful little man. And Jesus purposely stops, calls out to him, how unlikely that would be, and says, Zacchaeus, come down, for I will come to your house today. I will dine at your house today. He had elevated himself falsely, and Christ called him down in humility. He says, come down. I'm coming to your house. I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. The people were horrified because he was Zacchaeus. Why would the, 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 this, this, this Jesus fellow that was gaining more and more interest and, not, and notice of the people, even faith in some of them, why would he foolishly go and eat at the house of somebody who was more unclean than, a, than, than the Samaritans who ate pigs, than the Canaanites even? Why would, why would Jesus bother with him? How terrible. And he says, he is from the tribe of Abraham. He, or he is from the, the people of Abraham. He too is of Abraham. Because he, conf he came in, in humility and acknowledged the one true God. In humility, he said, I will give back fourfold what I've taken. Half of my goods I give away, Lord. This is, I understand, he had this understanding. In his humility, he all of a sudden could see, and his stature was no longer short. Of course, his physical stature probably remained short. Sorry, short people. <laughs> but he was properly in possession of himself at that point. And yes, he was of the Hebrew people. Yes, he was an Israelite. By birth and by, by blood, whatever that means. But Christ is establishing very clearly here something that we all need to understand about belonging. Every time we hear a gospel, and we've had several recently about belonging, and who is a foreigner and who is not, it's a little bit of a wake-up call. It's a little bit, bit of an eye-opener. Who is a foreigner? You see, that's not the first time that we hear about Salvation coming to Jericho. In, and then I'm not good at the, the timeline here because I don't I, I don't remember numbers. But at some time in the past, you could say in the Old Testament or the, the, the older part of the One Testament, I guess. We heard about Jericho, didn't we? Who can tell me when? 
From 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 the walls of Jericho. What's that? The walls of Jericho. The walls of Jericho. Joshua was seven. Just Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. And what happened? The walls came tumbling down. We all know that one, or most of us probably know that one. Uh, it's a lovely little ditty. And it happened. It's a, this is a, a historical event. It happened. They circled the city three times, blew the trumpets, and down came the walls. And the Israelites were able to possess that land that God had given them, the land of, uh, of Canaan. And what was going on when the Hebrews were being led by God to possess the land of Canaan? They were sending themselves into battle, this small group of people, and winning them all and decimating cities in the name of God, in the name of the one true God of Israel. And in order to do that wisely, you send a few scouts ahead. Well, that's what we hear about in Joshua. They send a couple of scouts ahead. And the guy who's in charge of Jericho, I don't know what they call him, the procurator, the governor, I forget. He, he hears about them coming. He's heard about them laying waste to cities and taking them over. And it's his responsibility to look after Jericho. And he just puts out an all-police bulletin, an APB, and says, find them. And they're being looked for throughout the whole city. And in the walls of the city, Rahab the harlot, the prostitute, lived with her family. And something changed her heart. She sees these men looking for a way to escape and not, not get taken uh, by, by the people of Jericho and to be able to report back to, to, uh, to Joshua. And she says, I, you come in here. You hide in my house. And I'll, I'll protect you. I'll hide you. And you just give me one, one assurance that you know, you'll take care of my family. And he says, you got it. And she lets them out the, the side of her window or something, lets them down out of the city. They go and report to Joshua. Joshua and the Israelites come and take Jericho, like, like the Lord intended. And Rahab became one of the people of Israel. You see, belonging was not hereditary. The people of Israel, the Israelites, were of various different peoples and races. When they came out of Israel, they were of all stripes and colors. What made you belonging to the people was uh, being circumcised and celebrating the Passover. That was the hallmark of belonging. Rahab was a Canaanite. But if you look at the genealogy of Christ, which we read on the Sunday before uh, the Nativity, we see that Ray, somebody, so-and-so <laughs> begot so-and-so, I can't remember, uh, by Rahab the harlot. She was in direct line of, of, uh, of genealogy to Jesus himself. After exile, after the, the northern and the southern kingdom, after Israel was, was exiled to, uh, to Babylon for, for 70 years, two generations or whatever, the only thing that remained when they went back was Israel. Everybody else had been dissipated into the nations. You see, all of Israel was not there in, in, in that kingdom of Israel. Judah was gone and all the, the rest of the tribes had been absorbed and swallowed up by, by all the peoples of the earth. They had been mixed back in. They were lost and didn't know it. Christ says, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. He was referring both to Zacchaeus, who was lost in sin. He was referring to the people of Israel who have been swallowed up by the nations. And he came to call everybody back to himself. Every nation. And he came to call you and I back to himself because we too are lost when we are sinning. We too are very small in stature. But we, make our, we build ourselves up. And when we are called to humility, we are called to realize that we have defrauded others. We have taken that which didn't belong to us. And I don't mean by, like, say, walking through this door and pocketing something, although if that applies to you, well, shame, 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 I know your name. Talking more than that, <clears throat> when we withhold forgiveness, when we withhold relationships that truly belong to others, when we withhold ourselves, parts of ourselves that truly don't belong to us, we have defrauded others. 
when we speak a cold word, we're taking something from someone else. When we speak ill of others, when it's best to shut our mouths, we have defrauded others. And when we realize these things by God's grace, through humility we bring ourselves to confession, and we once again are reunited to the people of Israel, which is the church. Through humility we are called out of our false, we climb, we climb to top our own egos, and we're called down by Christ. I'm coming to your house, because I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Father Adam, come out of that tree, you big dummy. I'm coming to your house. That's my cue to be like, oh, yeah, I've sinned a lot. Let, let me count the ways. Let me even try to begin to even realize all the length and breadth of my sins. Lord, have mercy on me. And in confession, I am restored to the people of Israel. Because I resolve at that point not to withhold relationships that truly belong to others. Not to withhold what belongs to other people. Not to speak askance, not to speak unkind words against others, not to bear false witness, whatever, whatever, whatever your sins are, whatever my sins are. I have at that point resolved to forsake that, to attempt to lay hold of humility, to attempt to reclaim and to make myself open to having my baptismal garment cleansed by Christ through humility. I am Zacchaeus. You also are Zacchaeus. Christ came to seek and to save that which is lost. I don't want to be lost anymore, and I know you don't either. Remember this story. It isn't just a sweet childlike memory, although that's useful, and I love it. I'm glad it's there. This is an absolute reality of our salvation, that we must be humbled for the Lord to save us. We must come out of that tree so that the Lord may dine at our table. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.